Distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second webinar of 2024 of the UNCTAD Informal Working Group on Consumer Protection in E-Commerce. I am Teresa Moreira, the head of the Competition and Consumer Policies branch of UNCTAD, and I would like to start with uh, introducing our speakers and, uh, well, and our coordinator, um, starting with Piotr Adamszewski, project coordinator from WOKIK, that is to say, the Polish Competition and Consumer Protection Authority. Then Stuart Mills, Assistant Professor of Economics from University of Leeds and Visiting Fellow of Behavioral Science from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Paul Seeliger, Project Coordinator from DAPDE, the German Research Institute for Public Administration. And of course, Professor Christine Riefer, the Coordinator of the uh, UNCTAD Informal Working Group on Consumer Protection in e-commerce. I will hand over quickly to Professor Rifa for some housekeeping um, uh, information, and later to the coordinator uh, of to the coordinator to the moderator of today's uh, webinar. Um, as I mentioned, Piet Piotr um, Adamszewski from Wokik, Poland. But before I hand over the the moderation um, to uh, Christine. Uh, let me mention uh, to those that are not fully familiar with our work that TANCTAD is the focal point for consumer protection within the United Nations system. And we are formally the guardian of the United Nations guidelines for consumer protection since 2016. Sorry, I don't know what happened. I will continue. This webinar is, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, being organized under um, our role as custodians of the United Nations Guidelines for Consumer Protection, which were lastly revised in December 2015 and contained since then a specific session on e-commerce recommending that member states should um, open quotes, work towards enhancing consumer confidence in e-commerce by the continued development of transparent and effective consumer protection policies, ensuring a level of protection that is not less than that afforded in other forms of commerce. So we uh, are here, as I said earlier, within the context of the UNCTAD Informal Working Group on Consumer Protection in e-commerce, e which was convened as requested by the UNCTAD Intergovernmental Group of Experts meeting on consumer protection in 2017 to highlight best practices, facilitate information exchange and consultations. For the work program of this year, the working group members decided to conduct three webinars and issue two technical notes before the next meeting of the Intergovernmental Group of Experts meeting on consumer protection law and policy which is scheduled to take place on the 1st and 2nd of July this year in Geneva. I take this opportunity to invite you all to save the date and join us for this seventh session of the IGE Consumer Protection. So as I mentioned um, already, this is the second of uh, a series of webinars on artificial intelligence. The first one took place at the beginning of February and dealt with the risks that artificial intelligence, that is to say AI, brings to consumers. We heard then experiences from two UNCTAD member states and the EU on tools used to prevent consumer harm, discriminatory practices generated using AI, and the work that is being undertaken by a European consumer association, Euroconsumers, on consumer complaints data and how it is being used for public enforcement actions. I invite you all to watch the video of this webinar, which was very highly attended. I think underlining how important and relevant this discussion is right now. Today, the speakers will present innovative solutions to enforce consumer laws more effectively using artificial intelligence. AI technologies can analyze vast amounts of data to identify patterns of deceptive practices or fraudulent activities and predict, therefore, 
potential risk for consumers. ANCTAD has been working with the use of artificial intelligence in consumers' online dispute resolution systems, having launched a report at the end of 2023, which concluded that AI could be instrumental in the optimization of ODR systems, even though it faces a number of challenges uh, related to bias, transparency, and alignment. However, the UNCTAD report also finds that for ODR, the potential applicability of AI is significant, particularly for solving issues such as the lack of human resources for non-easily automated tests, that is to say that AI technologies can automate repetitive and predictable tasks, freeing up human resources to focus on more complex and nuanced issues, the language barriers, Automated translation AI solutions can help to bridge these barriers and enable parties to communicate and understand each other more effectively. This is, of course, extremely important for cross-border dispute resolution cases where parties may come from different uh, countries and therefore speak different languages. And also to analyze data on past dispute resolution to identify patterns, predict likely outcomes, and inform the development of more effective dispute resolution strategies in the future. To incorporate these benefits, the UNCTAD report suggests that due to the global and expensive nature of e-commerce, there is a need for a collaborative international approach to addressing consumer protection challenges that consumer protection agencies need to improve their capacities in technology, which means recruiting specialist staff and training the existing staff. And exchange of experiences needs to increase between countries and where ANCTAD, of course, can serve as a platform due to its very wide membership of 195 members and also the fact that we welcome and are open to lively participation of other stakeholders, be it international and regional organizations and networks, academics, et cetera. So in this field, I also wanted to add that bilateral cooperation could play a very important role in technology transfer. And I believe this is especially important for least developed countries and developed, developing countries. So on this note, I wish you a very fruitful um, webinar and very um, interesting discussions that will be followed. And I will hand over to Professor Christine Riefer, uh, the coordinator of the Working Group on Consumer Protection in e-commerce, thanking very much the speakers for accepting to join us today, including, of course, our moderator, and also thanking in advance participants for your attention. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and welcome to everyone. Um, as uh, has been mentioned, we are running a series of events. Um, and before we start today, I want to start with thanking the Secretariat at UNCTAD because they are really working really hard. And that includes Valentina Rivas and Elizabeth Gashuri, who have been doing fantastic work in supporting the activities of the working group this, um, this year. So our very warm thanks to you. Um, it's a great honor to actually, again, um, bring to you another webinar where I think we're going to have a, a little bit of time to go into slightly more details um, with regards to the use of technology in consumer enforcement and how we can harness it for the benefit of all consumers. Before I hand over to Pietro, who is actually in charge of um, our um, webinar today, I just want to share with you all um, some information with regards to um, two things. First one is we're recording the, the webinar, so um, please um, make sure that you have all your microphones and everything switched off. Um, we also will upload the slides um, to our um, channel um, and that will um, be uh, advertised to you so that you can go and re-listen or pass it on to someone who couldn't attend. And also to let you know that we will have our next webinar coming up on the 21st of March, where we will be looking at protecting vulnerable consumers. But without further ado, now time to look into the use of AI and consumer protection. Yes, sir. Over to you.
Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Piotr Adamczewski, and I work as a director in Polish Competition and Consumer Protection Office. I'm working basically on enforcement, uh, but uh, also with this uh, with this work, I am trying to make some projects on uh, uh, getting more efficiency in our daily activity. And uh, I would like to also thank the ANCTAD and the whole organization for this possibility to co-organize uh, the workshops where we can uh, go deeply into the uh, work which we are having regarding the implementation of AI tools. And uh, it's our second seminar. I've, last year, we, we had the occasion to present the outcomes of the project on uh, detection of unfair terms of contracts with our tool Arbus. And this year we, um, we are focusing on the tool which will be working for the detection of the dark, of dark patterns. And to this regards, uh, we invited uh, our, our guest, uh, Professor Christina Riefa, who made the, the, the great research on all the technological uh, tools used by the consumer agencies to give us the, the, the background of what is happening within the world of the consumer agencies. But we also invited um, people from uh, academia background uh, and asking them to show the outcomes, the first results of their work and their uh, struggling with the tools for detection of dark patterns, which are uh, which is the, the job where is somehow overlapping with our job. And that's why we could discuss the, 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 the same problems, the same the same issues which we are facing in, in our work. So please welcome uh, uh, Paul Sillinger from, from the German Public Research Institute and Professor Stuart Mills from, from the University of Leeds. And uh, so I, I will just give the, the, the short introduction to our project, uh, what, what we already achieved and where we are with the preparation, with the creation of the of the new tool, and then, then we will go go further deeply into, into the some questions regarding the, uh, the detection of dark patterns. I just have to open my presentation. Yeah. Okay, so this this project is uh, also co-financed by the European Union, and we are getting the extra money which uh, uh, allows us to do some more things about the research and about the checking the different opportunities regarding the tools which we are using. So last time we prepared the first software on the, on the detection of unfair terms of clauses. And uh, what we noticed is that it is successfully used basically for the for the e-commerce. So of course we have the different kind of, uh, let's say, clients as the consumer agencies. We are uh, working with the bank sector, with the insurance sector, but there are some very sophisticated uh, and very delicate issues about the standard contract terms which they are using. So, of course, we can use the artificial intelligence for scrutinizing the whole sectors, uh, but in e-commerce, we are even more successful because there are many, plenty of, uh, of newcomers, plenty of small, medium-sized uh, um, traders who are using the regulations, standard contact terms, and they are applying all of them uh, online. So for that uh, issue, we can use uh, our AI tool very, very easily and very uh, in a very productive way. So what we also notice that they are engaged, a lot of them, they are engaged in uh, in dark patterns. And here we thought that 
uh, we could prepare another tool for the for 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 detection of the dark patterns. So uh, it's it's not the the, the the main point of this uh, workshops to introduce uh, to you the concept of the dark patterns. We all know that it's about the uh, interfaces. Uh, uh, which are designed to make consumer choices harmful by coercing them to doing something, by deceiving consumers to 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 to, to make some economical economical uh, harms to to consumers. And uh, with all that aspects, we all uh, understand that it is very strong need. And with the rapid development of that market, there is the strong uh public interest in uh, efficient actions of of consumer agencies in this area that's why we we focus on that and we try to first explore the possibility of using ai in this field but also prepare a methodology how we can work with the how we can work with dark patterns so there are first uh, research on uh, the category, cato, making the uh, basic categories for uh, dark patterns. What is actually happening on the market is 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 checked by uh, by different agencies, and uh, still there is the need to give the consumer agencies the the know how how we shall intervene, how we shall act with the with that problem, and. If there will be the possibility also to, to enhance the uh, speed of our enforcement actions, that it will be even even better. So that's why we are considering the AI and the solutions which are available. Uh, we have three years time for doing that. We already are in the stage of closing the open source intelligence. We scrutinized uh, Polish market, we checked how Polish traders are behaving. The outcomes are in line with what was already discover, discovered in the whole of Europe. And now we, are, we would like to go into the formal proceedings. Plus we would like to prepare the um, databases for the possible uh, AI solutions of, 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 uh, for, for detection of uh, dark patterns. And here we had uh, three, three ideas how we can make it uh, by preparation of uh, uh, databases uh, uh, covering uh, sources, uh, IT, IT analysis of the codes of the websites and uh, reactions of the consumers based on uh, consumer surveys and the final very very uh, sophisticated database on based on neuromarketing tests on the reactions of the people who are actually are uh, using the websites uh, which includes uh, some dark patterns so there we are with the project and uh, we have like first first outcomes uh, after uh, checking more than 300 uh, websites which in our opinion more than 100 of them exactly 136 uh, included some kinds of of dark patterns so we made the categories we uh, we prepared the first pre-assessment of the um, of the of that website and uh, we are ready to go into the the second phase where we will open the formal proceedings and we'll, where we will make more research on those three elements, which uh, shall give us the fuel for our databases, like this market neuromarketing test, consumer surveys, and IT analysis of websites. But at the same time, uh, when we are in the process of preparation uh, of uh, getting the, the best technology for uh, detection of dark patterns, we noticed that there are also other groups who are working on the same idea, on the same problem. And uh, here is this, this the, 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 the basic aim of, the, the, of this workshop where we can compare uh, the results of, of other groups and we, when we can check the um, uh, efficiency of, of, different, of different solutions. So here, 
we all we already uh, made some changes in our pro pro project uh, where we thought that uh, maybe we can also work on tests on chat gpt4 uh, we heard about the results of uh, what was done uh, by by professor mills uh, and it was very interesting the the, the scrutinizing of the screenshots of websites by uh, chat gpt4 and we, we, we are also using the, our first uh, outcomes of our survey for, uh, for the ChatGPT4, for giving, for fueling it with our uh, screenshots and discovering um, uh, and comparing the results of work of the AI uh, with our uh, own assessment. So maybe this is the, the, the good moment to, to rethink the idea of the whole project and to focus more on the test with ChatGPT4 and uh, working more on the um, uh, preparation of, of uh, making the processes more automatic and then just creating the new proof of concept. For, uh, for 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 the solution. So maybe maybe ChatGPT4. Uh, so it's the question which we have right now in the project will be a, a good uh, solution after uh, adaptation after uh, um, uh, securing the um, privacy data, about securing our own data after the whole process of making it uh, automatic. Uh, but it could be used, we think it could be used also for uh, the uh, creation of, of, the, of the tool for detection of dark patterns. Uh, uh, and uh, nevertheless, we, we have some time, still, still there is a time for the final solutions. Uh, still, uh, we have different options on the table, which direction shall we go? But definitely we will, we will finish with some kind of the proof of concept, whatever it will be whether we will use the created by us database, whether we will just uh, enhance the ChatGPT4 databases with our own databases. However, the, the, the outcome of the project will be the proof of concept. And then we will also add the guidelines for conducting proceedings and the white paper on the use of AI by a public bodies enforcing consumer law as a very important additional outcomes of the projects, gathering uh, our experience uh, first with the conducting of the proceedings and second with the general implementation of different AI tools into the uh, that kind of organization like ours, like the enforcement consumer agents. So here I will, I will stop and I will give the floor to the uh, next uh, to the next speaker, uh, to to Christine, to to give the overview and uh, and show you the already existing tools in the hands of the consumer agencies. Thank Thanks you. So um, yes, just very briefly, uh, what I will try and do is obviously link what um, work has been going on in your agency with what's happening in the wider world and how is AI featuring at the moment um, in the practice of agencies, but also further afield and how we can try and harness all of the technology that is available um, and deal with the difficulties, some of which you've already um, mentioned, um, in order to make progress in enforcing consumer law. So the EmpTech um, project, for those of you who are not familiar with, um, was a, a project funded um, by the University of Reading with some fun funding, um, external funding, and gave me and Liz Call, who's co-author and, and did a lot of the research on the project, the opportunity to go and, and, and look around as at what was happening. Um, what we have studied and is featuring in the report is 18 case studies of examples of EMFTEC, enforcement technology, in action already in consumer enforcement agencies, as well as 15 cross-fertilization cases, 
which are um, actually cases that are happening further afield in private entities or in public administrations and also in academia. Uh, and we've singled out those 15 because we felt they were particularly useful uh, and could be fairly easily adapted to uh, the work of agencies and therefore come and fill a need. Um, the report and the research was really exploratory at first, but very quickly concluded that we didn't think that embracing enforcement technology in agencies was a luxury. That actually probably was absolutely necessary to do and do as quickly as possible. Otherwise, um, there's a real danger that uh, practice um, by businesses out there will quickly overtake the manpower of all enforcement agencies and therefore there is a risk that they become obsolescent. So the main focus of the report is to look at what is MFTech enforcement technology used for. It's not specific to AI. We looked at a broad range of technologies. Um, and some of them are very, very simple. Um, we've used generational framework um, to classify them, not something that we need to worry about today, but if you want to look and understand more about how we came to our conclusion, please go and read the report. But we can find MFTech used in detection, mostly at, at present, um, of um, non-compliance uh, with consumer law. Um, we find it also in investigation and in enabling uh, better information gathering and evidence gathering. Um, but we also see some move towards um, using it for sanctions. And um, Liz and I strongly believe that as we harness the technology, we can imagine a consumer enforcement field that is completely transformed um, with the technology actually enabling us to um, sanction on the spot fines being issued um, in some settings, as well as even prevent by detection and, 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 and combat um, unfair practices in that way. The way the agencies have gone about it is very different. There's not two agencies that have done the same thing. Um, but what we find um, is that whilst there is um, a strong preference from in-house models uh, in the more advanced agencies or the ones that perhaps were bigger and already had more resources, um, we also see um, the use of outsourcing um, to be able to bring in the required expertise. By and large, I think that all the agencies that are currently using FTEC are using a mixed model with some in-house stuff as well as off the shelf or some outsourcing of bigger projects. So there's really no rule on how to start on that journey. Um, the main findings, however, is that whatever is currently happening is very exciting and that gains um, can be made in all settings, even in an agency that has never touched um, technology really. Um, there is some very simple technology that is not AI enabled uh, that actually can do wonders to um, support the work of enforcement officers. Um, what we did find, however, is that there is a technological gap between consumer enforcement practice and practice further afield. That's obviously, if you look at the private sector in particular, but other type of enforcement agencies, um, we find they are more advanced in their use of technological tools. With regards to AI, which is what we are concerned about today, we find that AI is spreading and spreading quite fast. But we also found a lot of warning signs and a lot of um, not necessarily concerns, but messages around the fact that AI is not always the right tool because it can only work wonders in particular setting and with particular conditions around it. So it comes uh, with a warning sign as well. The state of AI in consumer enforcement, um, it, I cannot pretend today that I'm gonna give you the actual figures. We had a very, very small sample and I wanna make clear the limitations of our data. Uh, we had a very small sample. We also only studied agencies that we knew were already using technology and, and were actually cited and already known for being ahead of the field. So that obviously skews your results when you're actually only going for people that are already early adopters. Um, we also relied 
only on desk study. We didn't actually go and see the AI in action. So um, we obviously have to go with whatever has been advertised as being the technology. And sometimes we didn't have it. So we had to infer from what the um, program was capable of, what it might be. Um, again, all of that is detailed in the report. Um, we also, for our cross-fertilization cases, um, re relied on a smaller sample, but actually with some bias because we went looking for things that we thought would be really good tools. So um, with this in mind, what we can say is that there's a clear acceleration of the adoption of AI tools in consumer agencies. Um, if we look at our tiny sample, uh, which was um, uh, eight, 10 agencies, uh, six consumer authorities were using EmphTech generally uh, in 2020. AI was really not heavily featured. And actually, every time we dug a little bit, it was an, um, data analysis tools that were actually uh, being favored. Um, by the time the research developed, uh, we estimated that about 40% of our use cases were AI. Um, and in 2023, uh, we've got 66% of our use cases being AI um, with an AI label. And obviously that's skewed also by multi-adoption in agencies. And Poland is obviously a typical example. We have two projects and the two of them are AI based. So obviously um, that does weigh in our result. Um, so we can't extrapolate, but we have seen a real trend in talking about technology enforcement. What we have found in the cross-fertilization cases is that AI was used in 80% um, of the cases and that the generations of technology um, also that was um, not AI were also more advanced. So um, a gap there, but hopefully because of discussions like today, uh, we are gonna catch up and continue to uh, deliver results for consumers. What we have found with regards to AI use as well as EmphTech generally is that um, as agencies want to adopt and move towards a more technological approach to their enforcement practices, there's a number of challenges. We've called them problems. Um, we have um, not really developed too much of how we solve them, but actually uh, created more of a working list of things to think about when trying to move towards EmpTech solutions. Um, when we're looking at AI, there are more specific challenges um, to, to address. Um, and perhaps the main one to mention today is really data, data quality and data quantity. Consumer enforcement agencies are um, in possession of a lot of data already, but they are not, if you compare with subtech fields, for example, financial service um, supervision agencies, they get given data by companies every year. Um, when you are also a private company trying to look at um, sales on your website as a platform, you have millions of adverts to put into your database to actually start analyzing things. So that's a big obstacle, something to think about in particular, along all of the other problems. Um, perhaps my main message is to also be wary of the hype. Um, I think to be able to develop very solid AI-based technology in consumer agencies, it takes time and um, it's not necessarily going to be the best solution. You also have to make sure that it doesn't become um, one of those low hanging fruits thinking that because we have this technology that can do this and that can be easily rolled out because it's been used elsewhere, we're actually going to solve loads of problems, um, maybe um, look beyond um, that um, um, silver clouds and I can't remember what the expression is now in English <laughs> um, and, and actually um, try and, and look at the reality of, of, of using the solutions. Nevertheless, we have found some really encouraging uses um, as well as positive results when this is rolled out very well. Um, so um, for EmphTech, we think that uh, obviously um, we're going to see in the next few years inevitably loads of agencies um, jumping in and we welcome that. Um, but um, we need to remember the differences um, as well as the need for sharing. And I think today is a great example of um, each agency's trying to roll out EnfTech in their practice needs to not try and just go it alone. There's already a lot out there and a lot of knowledge 
and experience to tap into. And I hope that in future, there can be many more of those conferences where uh, we hear of other experiences. So um, I'm gonna now hand over the floor to two speakers that are gonna exemplify what we can go and do in common in collaboration with other um, entities and also looking uh, further afield. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. The acceleration is here the most important word right now. So as we can see, there's so many agencies working on AI tools right now, and it was much less a few years ago, even like three years ago. Uh, but let's check what's happening in academia. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Mills with the topic approaches and tools for identifying and combating dark patterns, focusing on the use of AI. Stuart, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, which one was it? Uh, so having two screens is never useful for these things. Um, uh, firstly, as I said, for the um, opportunity to, to come and present to you all today. Um, I gave a extended version of this talk to the UK's Competition and Markets Authority last week. Um, so if any of you were in that talk, I apologise, this is probably going to be quite repetitive for you. Um, I just want to kind of, I, I want to start with spelling out some of the conceptual differences with myself and my team take from perhaps uh, some of the discussions we're going to have today. Um, but also I think highlight, highlight where there is definite crossover and, and uh, alignment of perspective. Um, so I am not a lawyer. Um, I'm an economist by training and a behavioral scientist by uh, branding. Um, and my, my team is, is, very, is, uh, is similar in that regard. We started this work around our patterns from a behavioral science perspective. Um, and we still very much approach the idea of a dark pattern from the perspective of a technique to change behavior. We're less interested in coming up with classifications and frameworks for different types of dark patterns and much more trying to understand how consumer behavior is changing and how consumer journeys are altered by different design strategies online. Um, if any of you are interested in, in, in some of the work we've been developing, I know these slides will be shared later. There's, there's several links to um, some of the work we've done. And from the perspective of how do we apply this stuff, how do we want to use this stuff, um, I think I think coming after a, a wonderful discussion of enforcement technology is great because our perspective is less about providing tools for consumers to use to protect themselves and much more about providing tools for regulators to audit whatever services fall under their regulatory remit. Um, so particularly things like uh, market uh, competition markets for the CMA. We've had discussions with the FCA in the UK for financial markets. Um, and this work has also had uh, some support in a, in a backroom dealings with uh, the UK's Department of Business and Trade. So lots of people, at least in the UK, uh, in government and in market regulation, very interested in the stuff we're talking about. And the exact tools I'm going to walk you through, and I want to just caveat everything I say today with this is very, very preliminary stuff. We need so much more research. The tools I'm going to show you today come out of a, a stream of work we've been doing of trying to manually audit and manually detect dark patterns in various online services. And what we found doing it manually is it takes a huge amount of time. It, it can incur significant costs, particularly when you're trying to scale these audits to a representative sample. Um, and many regulators in the UK, and I'm sure in many other countries, are concerned about the resource intensity of really getting on top of dark patterns, particularly if you're a, an organization like the CMA, you might regulate 100,000 different businesses. You can't do that manually. You need some sort of automation tool. And in particular, we've been thinking about AI as an automation and simulation tool. Um, and I'll explain what I mean shortly. The first thing I want to start out with is the sort of the things we started playing around with. Once we thought, okay, we have these resource constraints, AI has come along, we're interested in it. My, my group does lots of stuff with AI besides dot pattern stuff. So this is one of the first things we decided we'd play around with. I got someone in my team uh, to 
audit this uh, advertisement on the on the right here. I think we pulled this from a dark pattern repository. It's, it's just a general example of, of a deceptive design online. Um, and by audit, we just asked, asked uh, my colleague, go through, take notes of what you think is problematic here, what you think could potentially manipulate a person. And they highlighted things like confirm shaming. So if you, if you say no to this offer, you have to kind of admit to doing something bad. That's not necessarily good. Bunch of hidden costs around the nature of the deal, around the terms and conditions, very classic dark pattern stuff. Um, they also point out unusual... Um, option for closing this pop-up normally you'd expect it to be in the upper right hand corner but it's in the left hand corner maybe that is about delaying a person and so stealing some of their attention what we then did was we gave this image to gpt4 as a screenshot and we, we basically posted the same question audit this tell us what is happening in terms of dark patterns in terms of manipulations and it did quite well so it picked up on confirmed shaming about turning down the options uh, it mentioned hidden information regarding the, the, the discount in the advert. It called um, some of the terms and conditions stuff uh, relating to third parties buried information, but that's probably still hidden information, really. Um, I, it, it specified something that, that our human auditor didn't, which is they, they pointed, or it pointed out, I should say, that this advertisement came up as a pop-up, right? So that is disrupting a user's behavior. It's disrupting their flow throughout the service that potentially has behavioral implications um so three of the four things that the human highlighted gpt4 also picked up on and where it didn't pick up on a human point i think it raised a reasonably valid alternative point so there's clearly something here in these like small little experiments which maybe gets us thinking about the utility of ai now, we've, I, I've obviously not talked you through the experiments we were doing with human artists, but one of the experiments we did several months ago was we, we manually audited creating and deleting accounts for online services, one of which was Facebook. Creating and deleting accounts is a very nice behavior to, to model. It's a very closed behavior. You, you can, you've, you've got very defined goals. It, it, it's great for modeling, and so it's the go-to behavior. Uh, behavior we use whenever we're trying to audit online services. Um, and it started out for fun, but then we kind of pursued it further. We asked GPT-4 to create a Facebook account. And so we generated a prompt like this. We told it, pretend you're a 75 year old digitally inexperienced person. We told it what it was trying to do, which is trying to create a Facebook account. We told it where it was, which is facebook.com. And then we gave it this screenshot. The image you see on the screen is the exact image we gave the AI. Um, and we asked it, considering or simulating the person we've described and observing the screenshot that you've been given, tell us what action you think this person would take next. We also asked for the sake of collecting a bit of data. That the, I, I should say this is kind of speculative data at this point. We said, estimate how difficult you think this person would find this navigation task and how much time do you think it would take them to navigate to this website? So we put that prompt in and we get an output like this. We didn't ask it to, but GPT-4 gave us some description around the deceptive designs of cookie prompts. It told us what the action it wanted to carry out was, which was click allow all cookies. It estimated how difficult this person would find this task and it estimated how long it would take them. What we've been doing preliminary at the, point, at the moment, I will get onto this point later, is we then manually carry out the action. So in this case, we click allow all cookies. That takes us to a new screen. We generate a new screenshot, rinse and repeat. We do this for the whole behavior, which we're trying to model. So once you do this for the process of creating an account, you can start building up the user journey. And then what we what we argue with our auditing tools is you can then start auditing this user journey to figure out problem areas. Again, we're not necessarily interested in pointing out specific dark patterns. We're interested in pointing out parts of the consumer journey where people seem to be struggling and we want to know why. It's a high level tool which maybe guides further investigation. So we modeled three different people. These are very, very uh, uh, naive profiles we gave uh, GPT-4. We said, pretend to be a high digital skills person, an average digital skills person, and a limited digital skills person. And in terms of the sort of process that they all took, I can assure you with comparisons to humans, 
the number of steps it took is about the same. Th this data is reasonably comparable to how humans audit this particular behavior. There are some interesting behavioral differences. So people with high digital skills typically decline, or a, GPT-4 said a high digital skills person would decline cookies, but it said for someone with average skills or limited skills, they would accept cookies. Cookies are a classic example of dark patterns, as I'm sure we all know. Um, and in terms of estimating difficulty and time, broadly aligned with our hypothesis, if you have high digital skills, GPT-4 simulated, it would, it would not be that difficult. It would maybe take about a minute, 20 to make an account. If you have limited digital skills, it might be twice as difficult and take about eight or nine minutes. Nothing is too surprising here. For the purposes of testing whether AI can simulate this sort of auditing process uh, and dark pattern detection process, currently it seems reasonably aligned with the, the actual work we've done with human subjects. We also tested deleting the account. I bring this up because it tells us something very interesting. We already knew that deleting a Facebook account is much more difficult than creating a Facebook account. Um, that was shown again in the AI simulations. It didn't have any smart tricks. It took many, many steps to go through the process of deletion. Even someone with a high digital skills background, they fell into a, a, a loop, something we call a, a roundabout in our auditing framework indicating that there is probably some sort of deceptive design or, or difficulty which is obfuscating user behavior. Um, an average is to a skilled person, again, aligned with our expectations, it seems reasonable. They had a slightly harder time. They fell into more of these behavioral loops, which indicates they fell for more dark patterns in the design. Um, in terms of difficulty, high digital skills, it's about three and a half times more difficult to delete an account than create an account that broadly aligns with what we have found when we had humans doing this. Um, for average digital skills, it's about five times. Um, nothing is too surprising here. Um, and that's what we want if we want to test this tool. We, we don't want to be surprised. We want to see things that are reasonably comparable with expectations. Something that did surprise us, and I would I point out as a potential advantage of AI simulation given human limitations, is um, GPT-4 suggested something none of my team had ever thought of. To give you some background, when you delete a Facebook account, your account doesn't get deleted. For 30 days, it lies dormant. And if you log in at any point in those 30 days, your the account deletion process is cancelled and your account is restored. Everyone in my team knew this. So the moment we got to the account deletion page, we stopped. And we said the audit is over, we've collected all the data. When we modeled someone with limited digital skills, GPT-4 went through the whole process and it, it was a nightmare. It even suggested at one point someone with limited digital skills might open up Google and Google how to delete a Facebook account. Very reasonable, but certainly not indicative of good website design. It suggests people are really struggling uh, to navigate these websites. But they said once uh, someone with low digital skills has successfully deleted their account, they're going to go back and log back in. And it's sad, they're going to do this because they're going to check they've done it successfully, they've successfully deleted their account. But logging back in reactivates the account and they have to go through the whole process again. No one on my team ever thought about this because none of us would be classified as limited digital skills. We as auditors are not representative of all consumers. And so the AI, at least using the AI to play around with simulation, pointed something out to us which none of us thought of. And from a regulatory perspective, capturing those nuances is really important. And if there are these oversights, maybe AI is an interesting tool to pick up on. So to get back to automation, because everything I've shown you is just like us playing around, seeing if AI is roughly comparable with what we found when humans do it. It's not an automated process. That's what we're working towards. So. We have written software that can generate a representative sample of personas. Uh, in this case, we're using UK census data, but we could swap that out for any population. Um, it automatically generates prompts, and then it can automatically feed the prompts into GPT 3.5. We have to use 3.5 because we're simulating large numbers. We would use GPT 4 if we could. Um, the stumbling block right now is it's quite difficult to generate the screenshot generation and, and putting that back into an automated process. We're currently thinking about maybe using some sort of automated web browsing tool 
Um, if any of you know anything, we're, we're currently thinking about using a semantic web crawler, but I won't get into that. If we can crack this, it potentially allows us to audit all manner of different websites very, very quickly and at a scale that cannot currently be done. To get representative samples of user experiences, you need to be getting hundreds, if not thousands of, or you need to be modeling hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, that would take far too long to either do manually or to do with AI assistance. It needs to be an automated process. So we're working on cracking this. We haven't cracked it yet. But this is hopefully what this whole project is building towards. Um, I know we have another speaker coming and we have a panel. I'm happy to uh, take any questions when that, when that uh, comes along. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I think that we will we will go to the question and answer session after the the, the next presentation. Uh, yeah, just just a short comment that it seems that ChatGPT is quite smart. And now, 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 so the, the, there is a lot of jobs which we are losing right now. But definitely, the preparation of a proper prompt will be the the future of of the the good employment. Uh, in the near future. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go to to Paul, uh, and I would like to ask uh, um, uh, Paul Silger to to give the presentation on objectives and achievements achievements in detecting dark patterns about the dark pattern detection project DAPDE. Uh, Paul, uh, the floor is is yours now. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and. Uh... Welcome to the little presentation about our project. Uh, I'll try to keep it short so we have enough time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, so the DAPDE project, DAPDE project, however you want to pronounce it, is a cooperation project between the German Research Institute for Public Administration and the um, Heidelberg University. Uh, I'm part of the legal team in Speyer um, and Heidelberg does all the uh, technical stuff for us and being funded uh, by the German Ministry for Consumer Protection. Um, so and the project actually started in 2020. So uh, we're almost done with it. And you might also tell by the technical perspective we're taking, but more to that later. Um, so just brief, brief uh, overview over the content. I'll keep the first chapter very short, what are duck patterns, um, then what we were doing with our duck pattern highlighter, and then a very brief outlook how the legal perspective uh, interplays with um, the technical perspective or might interplay. So duck patterns, from an academic perspective, there's plenty of definitions trying to sum up what they are. They all are around the interests of the users, the interests of their creator, um, but there's not really the one definition capturing it all. It comes from UX, de UX design. And um, if you ask different people, they might understand different things under the term dark patterns. So actually the best way to go forward for a project was to look at specific uh, dark patterns, uh, which are quite clearly one of those. Um, so to start with, uh, we did look at the scarcity dark pattern, especially. So um, a website telling you how many more objects are available that might be true that might not be true which is the second question um, but it tries to make consumers um, decide quicker and maybe purchase uh, goods more easily with a, with a lower threshold than they would otherwise do um, there's the countdown duck pattern uh, trying to build up pressure by having uh, a design like this so it's ticking down and you might know it from ticket sales where there's goods which are limited uh, but you can discuss uh, whether it's a appropriate design for mass-produced goods which are probably not that limited as this gown might be and um, another one is the social proof pattern um, with real or fake uh, recommendation and rating systems trying to um, yeah grade and a good, more desirable, um, but there were definitely cases where websites used arbitrary numbers or arbitrary ratings. Uh, so those were definitely fake. And also, again, you can have the legal perspective 
where the truth is is relevant, but for dark patterns in general, might already be one, although the rating might be might be true. So a bit complicated. We have a very broad definition, and um, we did not feel like we could just fuel our dark pattern highlighter with the abstract definition. But we looked at those three examples, especially I just showed you. Um, and the idea behind the dark pattern highlighter, which was developed in, in Heidelberg, um, was to raise awareness as a first step and actually uh, make consumers able to uh, allow them to actually protect themselves by highlighting dark patterns. Um, we chose the form of a browser extension because many, if not most, dark patterns are being deployed uh, on websites. Also, they can be in, in applications and other forms, but this is the most common form of browsing the web. Um, and it's pretty much designed similarly to ad blockers, which some of you might know, which automatically block um, uh, advertisements on websites. Um, we also wanted to display information and have an automatic execution for uh, consumers or whoever uses our plugin. Um, so you don't have to do anything manually. So it's very convenient to use or should be very convenient to use, but we do not remove or manipulate any content on any website with the, with the plugin, but we just highlight it as the name says. Um, there's another very popular add-on which does actually manip manipulate or interact with websites, the consent o -matic, if you're interested in that, uh, dealing with uh, consent or cookie banners mostly, but that's just a side note. Um, you can use it on all the popular browsers. Um, so what does our highlighter do? I hope this video can see it. So we have a plugin and um, the highlighter automatically looks for cues on the on the website um, and can highlight them. This one was a countdown pattern, the last one. Um, we have different types. This is Amazon as a website. Um, there's scarcity patterns and you can actually click on the name of the pattern and you're being guided to our website where you find more information about the kind of dark pattern being deployed. We're not collecting any data, so this is all locally uh, happening in the browser. We're um, actually not using AI to to uh, find the dark patterns, but it's um, it's a kind of, a kind of, a kind of um, basic proof of concept uh, plugin so far. But we were able to um, find those those kind of patterns quite reliably with the plugin. Um, it's all text-based, so whenever a dark pattern might be in an image, it cannot be discovered by the plugin. Um, and so, as I said, like we started in 2020, and uh, as far as I understand it, um, AI was not as far as it is today, or at least not as present. Also looking at the other papers uh, dealing with the topic. So, yeah, we were a bit earlier, you could say. Um, if you want to test our plugin, um, you can find it on GitHub. Um, we did find some challenges also while using it because um, dark patterns can be very context-based. So Stuart, your presentation was very interesting to actually measure that, how, how context-based uh, dark patterns do work. Um, and the website's, website structure can easily um, uh, be altered so the plugin might might be rendered useless um, if website designers actually do not want uh, their website to be um, targeted by it. Um, also, we did not want to um, uh, lower the user experience. So um, I think whether when you have a plugin or some some kind of application targeting consumers, it has to be um easy to use it cannot alter the experience on websites in a bad way uh, and for example too many false positives might just be annoying so people stop using the tool um but we're very interested and excited about all the new uh, machine learning and uh, ai tools coming up and um very interested in whether and how they can actually um find dark patterns under the more broad definition maybe um, and how it can be further automized. Um, 
Yes, so check it out on GitHub if you want to. Uh, it can be used with all the uh, Firefox, Chrome, all the browsers you can pretty much think of. Um, just looking at time. Uh, yeah, I'll try to keep it short. Like um, the legal perspective is actually quite interesting. Uh, we're very European Union centered, so uh, please apologize. This uh, quite uh, European centered perspective, but there's uh, a lot of current legislation with my, which might also um, tackle the, the topic of dark patterns um, coming up. And I understand there's a webinar on this specifically. So again, I'll try to keep it short. Um, but also from our perspective, the, the automatic detection um, also has the issue of uh, has has legal issues because um, from a legal perspective, it's not entirely clear for some cases what dark patterns are actually illegal or legal, which might be used, which might not be used. And so to, it can be hard to translate um, that into automatic detection. And we have three very central parts of uh, digital legislation coming up or already in, in force. Um, the Digital Services Act actually is one of the first um, piece of legislation in the European Union directly addressing dark patterns and choosing a very broad definition for that as well. So there's de deceiving, there's manipulation, um, there's distortion. Uh, people should be able to make free and informed decisions. Um, so this is very broad and again, might need more clarification um, to, uh, to, re to actually um, give hints what is illegal, what's a dark pattern also in a from a legal perspective and which which practice should not be or cannot be used. The recital doesn't really help there. Again, a lot of text, um, seems like all of the definitions from academia, some, some kind of went in there. Um, but what does actually help is the third paragraph where um, the commission might uh, explicitly prohibit misdirection dark patterns. So we have one option which is more prominent than the other. Um, the nagging dark pattern where um, um, you're being repeatedly asked to give permission to process data, um, for example, uh, it can only be done once a year now from for intermediaries. And the Roach model dark pattern where it's more difficult to actually uh, sign off from a from a service than to um, to to create an account. So those might be more concrete uh, to actually detect. Also, they are more concrete from a legal perspective. With the Digital Services Act, we find more content um, in the Digital Markets Act. Actually, there's a list of very concrete um, obligations gatekeepers have to comply with. Uh, so again. It can only be asked for consent once a year. Um, and uh, that practically renders nagging dark patterns illegal now, um, which can be checked a bit more easily maybe um, with automate, automated uh, detection. Um, there's others in articles five to seven, but we have a very, like in comparison to the Digital Services Act, we have a very concrete list of uh, illegal practices. It is being, um, on the on the side, there's Article 13 coming with it, again going a bit broader and saying that um, all the obligations have to be complied with, and you cannot use um, behavioral techniques or interface design to circumvent them. So it's getting broader again. Um, so very different approaches to to regulation of dark patterns in digital services and digital markets act, and we'll also have to show which one is more effective or. Um, might actually help in combating them. Um, one very last thing about the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is not in force, there was just uh, an agreement in, in December, but it's very interesting because when we talk about artificial intelligence, it can be, as was said before, it can be used to detect, detect dark patterns, but it might also be used to create dark patterns. And the Artificial Intelligence Act or AI Act from the European Union um, does also prohibit the use of mani mani manipulative design or dark patterns um, by artificial intelligence. And uh, again, choosing a very broad approach. Um, and you can tell that there are many examples of classic, classic con consumer protection use cases for dark patterns. Um, but the AI Act is 
again, very broad in its approach. And my suspicion is that that is because there's just not enough examples of dark patterns used, being used automatically, or it might also be, um, you can also use, of course, the other um, regulations to combat them, but especially especially for artif artificial intelligence, we have this Article 5 um, pr practically prohibiting them um, and also targeting the vulner vulnerabilities of persons um, which might be targeted by dark patterns or first um, um, being tracked and um, the vulner vulnerabilities being uh, used for, for manipulation. So we have a very different approaches to, to dark patterns and their regulations. Um, we have our little plug-in, uh, which was more, more proof of concept, but it was was actually targeted to, towards the public audience. And um, yeah, I hope we have enough time for our discussion now. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I mean, both, both presentations were very interesting. Uh, so I will now open the floor for any questions from the audience. And uh, then, then, um, okay, uh, I have Michael Panzera, please. If you could unmute yourself and maybe switch on the camera as well. I'm not sure if that's the rule. Lentina? Can you hear me now? Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, I just have a, a question about the, the risk of false positives. Um, and, um, I was wondering if you could clarify how the plugin or does the plugin distinguish between um, certain types of dark patterns that um, that in some cases may be legitimate and some may not be legitimate. For example, if um, the if there's a timer that is automatically resetting, then it's obviously fake, um, and um, and is a it's an illegitimate dark pattern, but in some cases there's a, you know it could be uh, used in a proper way. Or you you mentioned the scarcity patterns, and in some cases you know there there it's it's a true statement that there are only two remaining, but in some cases it's obviously false because it will reset um, uh, or it's just randomly generated number. So does the plug plugin distinguish? between uh, what's happening behind the scenes in terms of uh, whether it's tied to a legitimate um, uh, fact or whether it's randomly generated. Is that uh, in, uh, does the plugin, is the plugin able to distinguish in that sense? I don't know if I'm explaining myself well, but. I think I did understand here. Um, in short, no. Um, because we decided to um, give attention to those designs and we decided not to alter the websites or manipulate them. Um, and from our perspective, it does not do any harm if a dark pattern or like a design is highlighted, which might be a dark pattern depending on the context. Um, it just shows people that there might be something um, going on. But technically, we chose the e easier way, if you, if you will. Um, and we also do not declare to only highlight illegal dark patterns um, but we 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 have the perspective more coming from um, a broader approach um, and just highlighting everything like every countdown every scarcity um, so the potential um, the potential for a dark pattern as a potential opposed to, for dark pattern yes. we've verified that this particular feature is is randomly generated or something like that it doesn't go that deep in other words no it does not no okay um christine i saw you raise nodding your head i was wondering if you were you were noticing the same issue there okay oh, thank you um, i think my point would be slightly different but it, it's it's more an aspect that we found, which is what's going to happen when obviously we start enforcing with the technology, what are the businesses going to do? And of course, here, a false positive or something like that is a, a clear route to the courtroom, isn't it? Um, and, and that's obviously for enforcement agencies, something to think about. And also any 
um, entity that would put out a tool to help consumers directly, would they actually have some liability in pointing to dark patterns that actually end up not being dark patterns, which is something that perhaps at the moment, yeah, a judge would be more Play, better place to kind of decide. So I think that that's one of the difficulties with um, the rolling out of use of technology. But uh, um, yeah, I, I haven't hadn't thought of that one exactly. And, but that's exactly why I'm, I'm raising the issue. If, if these tools are going to be used for purposes of regulatory, you know, oversight, you know, and, and we embrace reg tech to the extent possible, but but there's a concern about the false positives. And for example, there's another layer where some of these tools that are being used to detect um, certain, you know, dubious practices themselves are overstating their ability to, to make that detection. For example, um, AI tools that are used to detect um, uh, online reviews that have been generated by AI you know, themselves are overstating their ability to detect AI and we don't know how reliable it is. And so there's an open question as to whether regulatory authorities can use these tools for purposes of enforcement when the detection itself is is is, is kind of, uh, there are some gray areas there, let's say. So that's that's the only point that I was raising there. And so I was wondering whether there's even an ability to, to assess the accuracy of the detection itself, and and you mentioned um, the speaker mentioned that that there isn't yet kind of like a, a a testing of it, but so I was wondering if whether that was planned. Uh, I, on, on on the reg regulatory perspective, uh, from my experience right now, it's much more about just collecting the information, like the pre-assessment, and that's why even if there is the false positive, uh, we have still uh, time to 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 correct the, the the outcomes of the work of the machines. So with the Arbus, with the unfair terms of contracts, there are just flags. There are the recommendations. So the the, the machine is reading the the papers and is selecting the. Uh, uh, sentences, the, the provisions which could be unfair and it's flagging it. So the case handler has the opportunity to verify and to confirm or reject the outcomes of the machine. And here with the regulator, it could be the same, I guess. The, the other question would be uh, with the reaction of the business, if they would feel unfairly um, flagged as the potential dark pattern uh, by the plugin, which is actually used by all stakeholders, all the consumers. And here it could be my also question to uh, to Paul how to how to react to that kind of issues. If some businesses will intervene with the accusation that they feel uh, badly treated, that they, they, they should not be there. <laughs> and what what then? If they can appeal to the court, if they if they can seek for some compensation even. So what's your approach, Paul, about that? So we took the easy way um, to summarize it because it, it was meant as a proof of concept and uh, we were not um, aiming towards um, a final dark pattern detection application. Um, um, but yeah, I, I know of a project in Germany which was aiming towards uh, it was unfair clauses um, which were being analyzed, and they decided they were going towards uh, publishing it for consumers. But they went towards working together with the Consumer Protection Authority uh, in the end um, because they felt it's too insecure to to publish it, and they couldn't um, couldn't be reliant to only find the actual unfair clauses there. So I think it's a huge huge issue, and also for um, for our academia perspective, um, it might be such a big issue that people are hesitant to develop such a program, I feel like, because so many, you have to keep it up to date, you have to um, actualize it after the, the project might be over or done. And um, we, we are not able to do this at the moment. So there must be some other cooperation or whatever. Um, so it's actually been actualized and, and it can be used afterwards as well. So I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer for you. 
Okay, so I, I have two hands right now, and Christine and Antonio. Uh, so I, I think Antonio was first, but I, okay, I'm so. just reacting to what's just been said. Okay, so Christine, please. Antonio. If you don't mind, Antonio. Um, yeah, I think from from what I when I did a bit of the research for the Infotech project, um, I, I looked at the potential legal problems, and um, I think it will also depends on on who the enforcement authority is so in the uk for example um there's things already in the law that if you actually um sanction some company or ask them to stop a behavior when in fact the behavior is found to be perfectly fine um you actually then would have to shoulder the, their loss so so there might be a, in in legislative um circles some need to um, get on board with rolling out enforcement technology in, in enforcement agencies so that there's actually the right legal framework to be able to deliver that. Um, and there will be obviously inevitably some teething problems along the lines. Um, but I think at the moment, what we had seen is that as long as there is a, uh, a human oversight of what the technology is pointing to, um, the risks should be minimized. Where it becomes obviously more complicated is in my vision of EnfTech in the future, where actually the machines do all the enforcement themselves, then clearly we need to arrive at the legal framework and the right technologies working optimally to be able to deliver that. But in the interim, I don't think that whilst there's a lot of teething problem, we should refuse or, 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 or shy away from trying to use the tech to uh, get better results. Yeah, I think that we are quite far away from the moment when the machine will totally replace us. <laughs> so as for now, it's it's more about the pre-selection and pre-assessment and then later confirmation, I mean, under the normal rules and with the standard uh, right to defense for traders. So, Antonio, now you could. Yes, thank you, Piet, for the floor. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for this very interesting presentation about such a popular topic. First point about legal basis to combat dark patterns. From the experience of the Italian Competition Authority, the main legal basis actually still remains the Unfair Commercial Practice Directive. It's a long time that we are dealing about something which now is well known as dark patterns. There is this definition, but it's long experience that we have about tricky interface or misleading practice. In fact, it's very important to make a distinction between the most traditional dark patterns. Imagine preselection, uh, price, fake price reduction, uh, hidden cost, something which is very, it's very easy to combat this kind of dark patterns without behavioral study, without too much uh, investigation, simply uh, going to the points about the economic impact and using, first of all, the unfair commercial practice directives, which in our opinion remains the milestone in consumer protection. We have a big interpretation and enforcement of this directive. Of course, the Digital Service Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act have added something, especially for a new generation of dark patterns, which are more complex, more tricky. And in some uh, situation, there is the need for behavioral study, for additional evaluation to see if they have a tricky results. But uh, let me stress the point that for more traditional misleading practice is better to use the unfair commercial practice directive and go uh, strictly to the enforcement to try to stop this practice. Of course, I'm very much interested in the use of artificial intelligence tools to detect uh, unfair commercial practice and especially this kind of new dark patterns. We are dealing about this. Uh, you know that uh, Piotr knows we use the eLab inside the CPC uh, network, uh, which helps a lot, for example, for the price indication directive, web scrapers to monitor the prices in the last 30 days or something. We use it, for example, in the sweep on the influencer market. But we are interested to new about new 
software which can really be useful. Uh, sometimes we use some software to classify complaints and to set priorities in our activity because it's crucial to set priorities to see which are the most uh, common consumer criticality in some sector. But recently we are more focused on the, the need to find some very concrete tools, for example, dedicated software to detect two points. One, in the influencer marketing, the some software which can help to detect fake followers. You know, that is very common that uh, illegal seller try to uh, put on the websites package of illegal um, followers to increase the influencer popularity. They have even very reasonable prices and so are very attractive. So could be some software to help the detection of this specific. And it's very interesting because we want uh, from our very concrete enforcement perspective, even to stress the co-responsibility of the platforms, first of all, of Instagram, uh, because of course, if they have evidence about the uh, abnormal uh, increase of the number of followers, there is something which can be detected and the artificial intelligence, some dedicated software can help. More in general, once again, the unauthentic feedback. Um, Paul has mentioned some case of social proof of uh, fake reviews. Once again, you know that there are a lot of illegal practices to increase these fake reviews and it's not easy to detect. So I am wondering, uh, Piotr and Christine, if there could be some special uh, artificial intelligence tools and dedicated software which can help uh, on this because we have this very concrete uh, enforcement need and we are wondering about this possibility to use artificial intelligence to help uh, our very practical enforcement activity. Thanks, thanks very much. Christine, do you want to start? Um, well, thank you. first of all, I just want to say that it's just great that today we're able to really explore needs. And, and I think when, when I started on the report uh, with Liz, we actually really struggled to find the information and, and, and things were not really discussed. Um, I think I've got a long list of all the areas where clearly little tools are still needed. Unfortunately, I'm a lawyer. I'm not I'm not a technologist, so I've got the same limitations as most people. Um, but I, I think um, I, I will certainly uh, bring that back to the working group um, and see whether in future years we can put that on the work program and continue exploring and exchanging. And, and one thing that might be quite clever as well, I think, is to try and pull resources if we are able to organize it. I know I spend you doing some stuff um, together, uh, but that's not open to all the countries. Um, and, and obviously, Young Tad has got slightly different membership. The EU is doing things, but perhaps um, with, with the working group, we can try and find a way of all work together. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we worked, even if it wasn't perfect, from one dark pattern list and categorization? <laughs> um, and then we could all share the results, yeah, and feed the data. That could probably um, be helpful. But I, I definitely would put it on the list and we can definitely revisit it. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it's clear that after today, we're not going to be able to drop any AI or <laughs> MTech solutions going forward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so I mean, there is there is very interesting that there are so different needs actually that we can uh, we can actually uh, cover by the artificial intelligence. That's that's uh, uh, first thought, and the second is definitely f regarding whatever is digitalized and could be structuralized. Then there is the high possibility that AI could help us. So, like uh, Paul said, that in two thousand twenty when those projects just started and we also started our first uh, uh, thinking on using AI for reading the documents. It was quite unclear whether it can help or not. And now it's very obvious for everyone that with the ch time of the chat GPT, uh, it's, everything is readable and everything is possible. So yes, definitely for the influencers and the fake followers that could be the, the that kind of something which could be created. I, I could. I, I can say even more. I can say that probably there are some tools already in the hands of the big platforms which are used for that. 
uh, they have their own uh, tools definitely for discovering the uh, people who are uh, clearly uh, showing that they are in the cooperation with some brands or they are not doing that. The problem is to cooperate with them, to force them to, to uh, give the reaction for any uh, misleading practices on the market. And that's the that's the one of the tasks of the consumer agencies, how we shall cooperate with them. Definitely, it's not so easy, and it's we cannot just take the, 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 the tools from them. So probably there will be the future also for us uh, to, 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 to prepare a new ones. But I, I think that uh, regarding the ELAP, uh, you also, Antonio, mentioned the, the, the ELAP project. We have also Margarita here attending our workshop, and they are doing the great job. There are a lot of tools which are created and which will be actually in the in the public space uh, and uh, available for the consumers agencies in in the near future uh, I, I i see one question on the on the on the chat which uh, regards to the using of the of the chat gpt this is the probably the question uh, to Stuart. and uh, actually i would like to also add something to this question uh, Stuart. Because you mentioned about uh, two things. One is about the already existing code for preparing the prompt. And second, about working on the web crawler. Uh, what is your idea? So if you could explain to the first question, so how do you use the chat GPT? Um, it's like, very briefly, it's just taking the uh, screenshots of the websites and uh, feeding the chat GPT with that and uh, getting the results. But if you could explore a little bit on this more and also add some some clarifications about the the, the, the that code for prompts and the web crawler, how do you combine it with chat GPT? How are you wish to get the uh, this process more automatic to avoid making it manual? That's the problem which we are also facing right now. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, th I think perhaps linking to what the thing, first thing we started talking about, which is how do we avoid over detection or detecting the wrong things? The outlook of my group is, uh, and this may be an economist's view of things, every online service can be defined as having a starting point and an end goal that a user is trying to get to. And there will be an optimal route through the website layout. And that can be solved as a pathfinding problem there are pathfinding algorithms for it and we conceptualize potentially manipulative design not necessarily manipulative design but potentially manipulative design as techniques which cause people to diverge from the optimal path and the more you diverge the more likely it is that there is something uh, being built into the website to play with a person's behavior to try and get them to do things which they otherwise wouldn't do the classic definition of dark patterns so what we're trying to develop in terms of automated software is in an ideal world, we put in a website, we specify a starting point and a goal. One algorithm is the pathfinding algorithm figures out the optimal way through this website. The other is interacting with uh, GPT-4 to simulate different agents going through the same maze of a website and seeing what paths do they take based on the various things about them that we specify. Once we know the paths that different people take, it indicates that there might be deceptive designs being used. We've not identified any specific dark patterns. We've not accused anyone of being manipulative. But now from a regulatory perspective, we can look at specific parts of the user journey and specific parts of the website and think, OK, this part of whatever the consumer is trying to accomplish is leading them to take longer than they otherwise would want to, or to buy products that are different from what we would expect them to buy, so on and so forth. That's why we describe our approach as developing high level tools. We're not interested in detecting specific dark patterns because there are subjectivities around it. We're interested in filtering out this massive information about how do people interact in online markets into something that has a bit of a rational basis for, okay, we're going to focus our attention here or here or here.
Okay. Um, uh, I'm just checking the chat and the time at the same uh, moment. I'm not sure, Valentin, we are coming close to the end of the session. That's correct, uh, Piot. I would like to give the floor for a uh, final minute to Christine Rita before we close. Um, so we're actually closing. So I, I thought it'd be nice to hear Piotr's thoughts on what he heard today, because he's at the front lines. And then I close just uh, with some, again, ice keeping point and research and, and what UNCTAD is planning to do within the remit of the uh, working group. All right. So so I, I have at least two, two, two basic thoughts for, for what I heard today. And first is that we have, uh, like, we are meeting each other since some time and each, each, each time it's much more uh, progress regarding that field. And uh, what we were talking about one year ago, that probably we will be facing the problem of the spaghetti where we will have different solutions and th there will be the need for structurizing them. I guess that we are at the point, uh, at least we are much closer to that point. And and with with the with the ELAP and with other agencies solutions and with academia and etc. So everyone has something interesting, something which can be used. And it's uh, it, now it's it's time to 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 verify with uh, with the other stakeholders what they have, not to open the, the same door again, like agency by agency. It's the time for for cooperation. That's the first thought which I have. And se second, more specific, is about the progress uh, in direct patterns detection. So with the with the work which was done by Paul, with the plugin, probably we are one step further because of just the advancement of the of the technology of, of what what is available, and still there is the the the, the strong. Uh, uh, challenge for us, which we are facing, and, and Stuart is also facing that, how to make it more efficient. So we have a great opportunity with the ChatGPT uh, and with other already existing programs, which could be used by the agencies as well, if some circumstances are uh, taken into account. Um, but but the, the, the challenge is to, to use them properly and efficiently. So, so here is the, the, the second thought. And here we will we'll go with our project further with more tests and with, with checking how we can make all that processes more automatized, more automatic. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's all from my side. I would like to also thank everyone, uh, all the guests for your great input and all the participants for the um, uh, for your time and for the for the questions to the discussions thank you very much and christine please thank you um great i mean the time really flew today um, and and yet we feel we haven't really scratched the surface <laughs> um so um the only two points that i wanted to raise first is that um obviously we will continue to look into what needs to be done in the future um, within the confine of the working group. Um, but in the immediate um, time, the working group output uh, for this year will include a technical note on AI and the protection of consumers, which means that uh, the Secretariat, uh, with my help, and I hope we will tap into quite a few hands that are present today, um, will help in writing a document which we hope will help people understand the field better and perhaps get a gauge for what's going on and where the needs are. So I can I invite everyone who's attended who know of any EnfTech AI in consumer enforcement um, application or something that could apply to contact us and send us that information. The richer the information we receive, um, the richer we can make our technical note and really reflect the state of the art. Um, and any ideas also for the future and the work of the working group is always welcome and um, safely guarded and kept by the Secretariat uh, in case I forget. Um, so if you have any idea or um, specific needs that you'd like to be explored 
um, in, in future work packages, then please um, do let us know and we will try and accommodate as much as possible. To explain to all how the technical note will be developed um, so that it is clear there will be a draft going uh, first to what we call our steering uh, group, steering committee of the working group on consumer protection in e-commerce, um, to obviously being um, a first review of the draft um, when we feel that's a bit more ready and everyone is in agreement in the steering group, then it will go to the wider membership of uh, the working group, um, which um, at which stage everyone will be able to contribute some amendments and make some suggestions. Um, and then we will arrive, obviously, at a final version that will be endorsed by the working group and presented um, in July at the um, IG. So on that note, uh, can I thank again all our speakers today for fascinating discussions the great insightful questions um, that have opened another Pandora's box. Um, our thanks also to the team in Poland who has put the seminar together alongside with the Secretariat. And uh, I think from us and to all, uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever time zone you are in. Don't forget our next seminar. Uh, you will receive some information and we'll talk about vulnerable consumers. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.